To determine if IV access is needed, you must complete an assessment of your patient and determine if there is an indication to start an IV. Indications would include IV blood sampling or blood draw, fluid resuscitation, IV medication administration, blood replacement production or blood transfusion, IV contrast dye. During the location assessment, ensure that there are no contraindications where you will start the IV. Contraindications include an extremity with significant edema, burns, fractures, phlebitis, thrombus, or overlying cellulitis. Remember that you cannot start an IV on women after an ipsilateral, or same side, radical mastectomy with lymph node removal as it contributes to lymphedema. You also cannot start an IV on a dialysis patient in the extremity with a fistula or AV graft. To start, be sure you have introduced yourself to your patient, confirm their allergies, and gotten consent to start an IV. Ask the patient if they have had an IV before and if there is a preferred or better access location if time allows. Once you have explained the procedure to the patient, you can start gathering and assembling your equipment. Step 1. Gather supplies. Gloves, tourniquet, catheter, 5 or 10 milliliter flush of normal saline, saline lock, alcohol wipes, 2x2 gauze, and tape. Step 2. Examine the individual's veins in the selected area. You want to make sure that they have a suitable vein for insertion. Choose a suitable vein. The preferred sites for IV cannulation. In the hand. The dorsal arch veins. In the wrist. The volar aspect. At the cubital fau saw. The median anticubital, cephalic, and basilic veins. In the foot. The dorsal arch. On the scalp. The scalp veins should only be used once other alternatives are exhausted. Step 3. Apply the tourniquet. After examining individual's veins, you are going to apply the tourniquet. The best method to start a tourniquet is to use the simple rubber tourniquet band provided in the IV kit. Don't apply this until you are ready to begin palpating for a vein. IV tourniquets should not be left on for more than 2 minutes. These bands are very lightweight and flexible, and they allow you to make a simple but effective compression on a patient's arm without actually tying a knot. Instead, loop it around snugly, cross the bands, and form a simple loop. This allows you to remove the tourniquet quickly and easily once you've finished your procedure. At this point, you will decide which vein you will use. Position the arm downwards. Dependent positions increase capillary refill and may increase the likelihood you will successfully insert the IV. Choose the most appropriate puncture site. The catheters are for peripheral use and should be placed where veins are easy to access and have good blood flow, although the easiest accessible site is not always the most suitable. Avoid inserting the IV catheter close to a flexible joint where it may bend. A bent or kinked catheter can be a source of complications. The veins in the anticubital are often easily accessible and ample, but note that this joint often bends causing a high risk to kink the catheter. Look for as straight veins as possible and palpate for good elasticity and filling. Try to avoid stiff or fragile veins, also veins under sore skin. If the patient is elderly, apply a tourniquet carefully as not to pinch the skin, which may cause skin tears. If necessary, apply it over the patient gown or clothing. For the tiniest patients, babies, and neonates, the veins on the ankle, close to the foot, are often preferred due to easier access there. Prepare for an aseptic technique once the vein is selected, and don your non-sterile gloves. Step 4. Cleanse. You are going to cleanse the IV site. This prevents bacteria and or infections from potentially getting into the bloodstream. Cleanse the area with an alcohol prep pad in outward concentric circles, outward from the insertion site to approximately 2 inches to 4 inches, not back and forth. Back and forth will re-contaminate the insertion site. Allow the alcohol to dry thoroughly, do not blow on it. Step 5. Prepare the needle for insertion. Make sure you use a new, unopened needle that is still in its sterile package. Remove the needle from the package and ensure that catheter can unhook from the needle. Step 6. Select the appropriate catheter size for the patient depending on age and location of cannulation. A rule of thumb is to choose as small a catheter size as possible to maintain maximum blood flow around the catheter. 
A small catheter will also minimize the risk of damage to the blood vessel. Always consider the purpose of placing the IV catheter and assess the patient's blood vessels carefully. Never use a larger catheter size than necessary. The IV catheters are color-coded depending on size. The color correlates to a gauge size according to the applicable ISO standard. The higher the gauge size, the smaller diameter of the catheter. The biggest diameter for IV catheters is 14 gauge, and the smallest is 26 gauge. Step 7. Insertion. First stick success is always the goal. Any additional attempt of insertion increases pain and stress for the patient, adds workload to the caregiver, and costs to the healthcare system. Hold the patient's arm and place your thumb below the chosen puncture site to stabilize the vein. Ask the patient to make a fist to make the vein more visible. Inform the patient that they will feel a slight pinch in their arm. Insert the needle into the selected vein using a direct approach. Enter the skin directly over the vein and puncture the vein at a 15 to 30 degree angle with the bevel facing upwards and wait for the blood to return into the clear cylindrical chamber. Slightly decrease the angle of the needle once you have entered the vein. You will feel a slight pop sensation when you have caused a venipuncture. It is crucial to observe the flashback of blood to know when the needle is in the vein. Flashback will be visible in the chamber connected to the needle as soon as the needle is in the vein. Always continue and insert an additional 1 to 2 mm to let the catheter, not only the needle tip, reach the inner lumen of the vein. Continue to insert only the catheter and carefully withdraw the needle simultaneously. You will now see blood between the catheter and needle, the second flashback, which confirms that also the catheter is in the blood vessel. The needle should be disposed of in a biohazard or sharps container. Step 8. Release the tourniquet. Do not thread the needle up the vein. This will cause a catheter shear resulting in a foreign body embolus. If there is no blood return, you can release the tourniquet, apply direct pressure with 2x2 gauze, and apply pressure to the puncture site until the bleeding stops. Again, keep the patient's arm straight. You can then make a second attempt at a different site. Step 9. As soon as the needle stylet is out, you immediately need to close off the lower end of the IV catheter, either with an extension set or saline lock. Ensure the saline lock is in the open position. Step 10. Check for patency. Number 1. Clean the port with an alcohol swab. Number 2. Connect the flush device to the lure connect medication port. Number 3. Slowly pull back on the plunger to aspirate blood and confirm the placement of the con u law in the vein. Number 4. Slowly inject the saline flush solution into the catheter, maintaining positive pressure by clamping the connection, tubing or T connector, before removing the syringe. Positive pressure flushing prevents the backflow of blood into the con u law with syringe removal and may increase the life of your patent IV site by reducing the potential for thrombus formation. Insert a 5 or 10 milliliter syringe of normal saline into the medication port to ensure that fluids can move freely through the IV. Before any infusion or injection, it's always important to confirm the correct placement of the IV catheter and good flow. Flush the catheter with saline and ask the patient if they feel the cold solution in the vein. If it's not a communicative patient, place your fingertips of your non-dominant hand, the one not holding the syringe, at the level of the catheter tip and feel the cold yourself. Also, look for any swelling in the tissue. Step 11. Protect the insertion with a bio-occlusive dressing to prevent infection and stabilize with tape or splinting to ensure it stays in place. Always fixate the IV catheter carefully to keep it in place and in a stable position. Use a transparent dressing over the insertion site to facilitate regular inspections. You might also need another layer of protection, such as extra gauze, cling, or a splint, to further protect the IV catheter and minimize movements and vein irritation. Always flush the IV catheter with saline after each usage to prevent blood clotting and be able to use the catheter as long as possible. Attaching an extension line is a standard recommendation in guidelines. The extension line could increase the indwell time of the IV catheter as it enables the medical staff to operate away from the catheter, minimizing the risk of contamination and movements. Clean any body fluid spills. Remove gloves and perform hand hygiene. 
Monitor the patient for a few minutes after the procedure and inspect the venipuncture site for bleeding. Check for complications after placement which include Early signs Bruising or hematoma A bruise from an IV typically forms during or after IV treatment when the punctured vein wall allows blood to enter the skin and pool inside it. After which, the outer layer of the skin absorbs the blood and holds it there, resulting in discoloration. Inflammation There are five symptoms that may be signs of acute inflammation. Redness, heat, swelling, pain, and loss of function. Infiltration is the accidental leakage of non-vesicant solutions out of the vein into the surrounding tissue. This can occur with many antibiotics, dextrose solutions, or even normal saline. When left unchecked and untreated, IV infiltration can result in pain, swelling, compartment syndrome, and even amputation of the affected limb. Extravasation When the leaked solution from infiltration is a vesicant drug, one that causes tissue injury blisters, or severe tissue damage, it is referred to as extravasation. Injuries from this type of IV failure can be severe and lead to the loss of function in an extremity, and if the damage is severe enough, tissue death, known as necrosis. The difference between infiltration and extravasation is the type of medicine or fluid that is leaked. Infiltration, if the fluid is a non-vesicant, does not irritate tissue, it is called an infiltration. Extravasation, if the fluid is a vesicant, a fluid that irritates tissue, it is called an extravasation. Left untreated and unchecked. IV infiltration can lead to excessive fluid in one or more compartments of the arm, causing damage to nerves, arteries, and muscles. This typically requires surgery to prevent a permanent loss of function and possible amputation. Some significant signs of infiltration and extravasation include Swelling at or near the IV site. The skin will feel tight and cool to the touch. Some patients experience intense pain or burning, while others may feel slight discomfort. Skin discoloration. Numbness. Impaired blood circulation. The symptoms a patient experiences often depend on the severity and length of the infiltration. Air emboli. Occurs when the solution container runs empty and the added container pushes air down the line into the patient. Air emboli can develop within 10 to 20 minutes or sometimes even longer after surfacing. Signs of air emboli include Difficulty breathing or respiratory failure Chest pain or heart failure Muscle or joint pains Stroke Mental status changes, such as confusion or loss of consciousness Low blood pressure Blue skin hue Air emboli can occur with the insertion or removal of intravenous catheters. Though the risk of air introduction is present with any vascular intervention, few cases of air embolism have been reported from intravenous access alone. Late signs Phlebitis is the inflammation of a vein. Phlebitis may occur with or without a blood clot. If it is also associated with clot formation, it is known as thrombophlebitis. It can affect surface or deep veins. Trauma to the vein, for instance, from an intravenous catheter, is a possible cause. Symptoms include redness, warmth, swelling, and pain in the affected area. Infection. The insertion of an IV catheter provides a potential portal of entry for bacteria to cross from an unsterile external environment to the ordinarily sterile blood. The second route is via the catheter hub, which can become contaminated by healthcare workers or patients' skin flora during the connection of fluids, medication administration, or blood extraction. The third route is for catheters to be contaminated directly by bacteria circulating in the bloodstream. That is, the patient has an existing bloodstream infection, and microbes can attach to the catheter as they pass by the device. The fourth is contaminated infusate, which may occur at the manufacturing stage, intrinsic, or during manipulation by healthcare workers, extrinsic. Recent research confirms that infusates other than water, including heparin, have great potential to form crystals in the intraluminal surface of peripheral venous catheters, which can induce bacterial attachment and colonization, promoting systemic infections such as sepsis. Nerve damage occurs due to improper venipuncture technique, tight taping, or improper armboard application. When an IV catheter penetrates a nerve, it can cause temporary or permanent damage. 
After sustaining an injury, a nerve will regenerate in an attempt to reconnect with the fibers it once innervated. Recovery from nerve damage may take only weeks or a year or more. Some patients, however, may sustain lifelong damage depending on the severity of the needle stick to the nerve. Thrombosis Thrombosis occurs when blood clots block veins or arteries. Symptoms include pain and swelling in one leg, chest pain, or numbness on one side of the body. Complications of thrombosis can be life-threatening, such as a stroke or heart attack. If any complications are found, be sure to discontinue the line, apply direct pressure at the insertion site, and start a new attempt more proximal or use another extremity for a new IV access site. How to accurately document IV insertion? Be sure to include 1. The date and time of insertion 2. The anatomic name of the vein cannulated 3. The gauge, brand name or type, and length of the catheter 4. Indication for initiation of the IV 5. The number and location of attempts 6. The type of dressing applied to the site 7. What solution or medication the patient is receiving via the IV and the flow rate 8. The name and amount of medication in the solution, if any 9. Any adverse reactions and actions taken to correct them 10. Patient teaching and evidence of patient understanding 11. How the patient tolerated the procedure and the response of the patient 12. Your name and credentials For, for more information and other videos, check out our website at dieseltherapyacademy.com, follow our blog and social media pages, and check out our student EMT, paramedic, and nursing exam prep apps available at the Apple Store and Google Play. If you found this video helpful, please like this video, subscribe to our channel, and request additional topics you would find beneficial in the comments section below.